Welcome to Going Antiviral, the podcast for the IAS USA, a professional continuing medical education organization focused on HIV and other viral diseases. I'm Dr. Michael Sag, Professor of Medicine and Infectious Diseases at the University of Alabama at Birmingham and volunteer member of the IAS USA Board of Directors. Welcome to the Going Antiviral Podcast. Today, February 8th, 2024, we are speaking to Dr. Chip Schooley. Dr. Schooley is a distinguished professor of medicine in the Division of Infectious Diseases and Global Public Health at the University of California, San Diego. He completed residency at Johns Hopkins and Infectious Disease Fellowships at the NIH and Massachusetts General Hospital. He joined the faculty of Harvard Medical School in 1981. Dr. Schooley's longer-term research efforts are directed at the pathogenesis and therapy of viral infections. He has been heavily involved in the development of antiviral chemotherapy directed at HIV, hepatitis C, and herpes viruses, as well as in research, teaching, and infrastructure building efforts in sub-Saharan Africa. Following his successful treatment of a multidrug-resistant Acinetobacter balmani infection and a fellow faculty member at the University of California, San Diego, he became interested in the use of viruses as therapeutic agents, namely the use of bacteriophages to treat multidrug-resistant bacterial infections. He serves as a co-director of UCSD's Phage Research Center, the Center for Innovative Phage Applications and Therapeutics, or IPATH, at UCSD. Chip, welcome to the program. Thanks, Mike. Nice to be here today. It's good to be with you. Let's start with just a general description of how often are we seeing full antimicrobial resistance among bacteria? Is that a growing problem? It's been growing for a number of years. We've uh, seen new antibiotics, of course, introduced uh, relatively frequently up until about 15 years ago, and then th- things have slowed down. Uh, within a few years of each antibiotic being introduced, we'd be, we've always begun to see resistance uh, developing in clinical isolates, and that trend has continued in the face of a slowing antibiotic pipeline. So what we're now seeing is an increasing number of people for whom antibiotic uh, options are really quite limited. And there are antibiotics, but they're antibiotics like colistin that we don't like to use and uh, sometimes they're antibiotics that a patient uh, uh, is uh, is unable to tolerate. So uh, limited options are becoming more and more an issue for people uh, in uh, both the community and in the hospital. So as I said in the introduction, uh, you had the experience firsthand to use bacteriophages uh, in uh, the treatment of a colleague. Uh, let's go back to the beginning for those who don't know Exactly what is a bacteriophage? Bacteriophage literally means bacteria eater. And uh, these were described a little over 100 years ago uh, when people noticed that if you uh, recovered bacteria from, uh, in this case, in, the, in that case, rivers uh, in, um, in India and grew them on an auger lawn and then played it on top of that auger lawn uh, water from that same river that had been filtered to remove bacteria, holes appeared in the lawn. Something was eating the bacteria. At the time, it wasn't known that these were viruses. We didn't know a lot about viruses at that time. Uh, But it came to be known about 15 years later that these were actually uh, viruses, the oldest viruses on the planet, the one that adapted to attack bacteria hundreds of millions of years ago. The viruses that we've been dealing with medically, uh, are newbies uh, because they uh, came along after we did. And uh, uh, these uh, little uh, bacteriophages have been interacting with their hosts for much, much longer uh, than the viruses that we deal with all the time. So we always tend to think about viruses that affect humans. And I think what we're saying here is that viruses exist that attack most any living organism, in this case, other bacteria. So the no, the notion of use of bacteriophages aren't isn't just in the rivers in India um, or even perhaps therapeutics. It's also used in labs uh, around the world to sort of create situations where you can grow um, different uh, types of genetic material. Have you ever done that in the lab yourself? 
I've not done it myself, but um, the um, it's something that basically has been the uh, cornerstone of, of modern molecular biology. Uh, the um, uh, phages that um, live in bacteria have two gen- general lifestyles. They can either be lytic, in which case they um, enter a bacterium, take over their metabolism, and uh, replicate themselves. And over the course of about 20 minutes, make 100 or 1,000 copies and then blow up that bacterium and go on to bacteria next door. The other life cycle is called the lysogenic life cycle. And in this case, or the temperate life cycle, in this case, the phage gains access to a bacterium and then integrates its DNA into the DNA of the bacterium. Uh, And then when the bacteria uh, replicates, takes itself with it. Periodically, uh, the... uh, phage will um, lysogenize or become alive and begin to replicate. And sometimes when it does that, it takes bits and pieces of the DNA of the bacterium along with it and transfers it to other bacteria. Uh, This uh, pattern uh, has been something that molecular biologists have taken advantage of for many, many years to manipulate genes and um, uh, is the basis for um, a lot of work with restriction enzymes um, and CRISPR-Cas. These were not things that were developed by Nobel Prize winners. These were developed hundreds of thousands of years ago by phages uh, and by bacteria in their uh, dance that has gone on uh, trying to coexist. So this cornerstone of molecular biology uh, used for many years in people's labs, suddenly folks got the idea, well, wait a minute, if we know these bacteriophages exist and we have resistant bacteria that's within uh, a human host, uh, the thought was maybe you can use these to kill the, the pathogenic bacteria inside the patient. Um, but it, as I think about it, just on the surface, it, you know, here you are, you're going to uh, give an infusion or whatever of uh, these known viruses uh, into, a, uh, into a human uh, I bet that's a rather daunting idea when you first used it. Uh, how did you work through that in your head? Well, to some extent it was, but you have to realize um, that uh, and, and, and get a little bit out of our human skin, if you will. Uh, we are nothing but reefs on which bacteria and phages live. Uh, there are many more of them in the world than there are of us. Our GI tract is loaded with bacteria, and those bacteria are being attacked by phages every day. Millions of phages move in and out of us every day, uh, and the amount that we uh, use for therapy is kind of a drop in the bucket compared to what we're already carrying. So these are um, viruses that we're well adapted to and that, um, frankly, we, we need. Uh, and in the therapeutic arena, what we do is we choose phages that are active against the target bacterium. They have generally relatively narrow uh, spectrum, so unlike a broad-spectrum antibiotic that kills everything in sight, it's kind of like using a laser rather than a hand grenade and trying to treat an infection. And it's uh, gentler on the microbiome and less likely to have you be back the next week with uh, organisms that are even even less treatable. Um, The um, idea to use them as therapy actually came along before molecular biologists were trying to use them as uh, tools in the laboratory. Uh, it was uh, not too many years after the discovery in the 1910s and uh, uh, between 1910 and 1920 that uh, they were actually being used in people and sold by pharmaceutical companies um, as anti- antimicrobials. Uh, they were sold in the U.S., they were sold in Europe, uh, and um, uh, they weren't all sold off the back of, um, of uh uh, snake oil wagons are actually sold by reputable pharmaceutical companies. And the problem at the time was nobody understood the microbiology of them. They didn't understand how narrow the spectrum of activity was. And so they were selling uh, uncharacterized phages to treat syndromic diseases. In other words, they were using phages to treat diarrhea or to treat pneumonia without um, trying to understand in that patient what organism was causing that syndrome. So as we all know, as ID people uh, and as internists, there are a lot of things that cause diarrhea. And if you know that a particular person's diarrhea is caused by salmonella, you need to use a phage that's active against salmonella, but not just salmonella in general, but that patient's salmonella. And so that um, the um, 
The ability to find that laser requires um, isolating the organism uh, and then looking at your phage collection and using it. The way these were used in the 20s is uh, uh, mixtures of phages were grown up by throwing um, phages uh, from sewage and other places into mixtures of bacteria. And then uh, these mixtures were filtered after uh, a number of hours. And then this kind of uncharacterized mix of different types of phages uh, were administered, usually orally, uh, sometimes um, topically on wounds. And they were sold with cute names like pyomyophage uh, for um, uh, muscle infections and uh, uh, intestophage for diarrhea. But most of the time, people were receiving phages that weren't active against the organism they had, and they were being delivered by routes that destroyed them by the time they got to the site of infection. And what's changed is we've learned now uh, how to... um, uh, we've learned a lot about the microbiology of phages and that you have to actually find the right phage for each infection you're treating. Uh, we've learned uh, how to produce them in a much uh, more efficient way and to purify them so that we can give them perennially, intravenously, um, into wounds, um, uh, in ways that, that we know they get to the infection. Uh, until uh, this uh, recently, when uh, we treated our patient here in San Diego, Virtually all the phage treatment was done uh, either by uh, an oral route uh, or by a topical route because of the endotoxin that was in the phage preparations. Uh, Phage given orally, um, some get to the, uh, past the uh, stomach, uh, past the uh, gastric acid of the stomach, but most don't. Some get absorbed, most don't. So in in essence, uh, um, systemic delivery by oral routes is really unreliable and um, and when you combine that with the um, uh, poor microbiological understanding, it's not surprising that people had assumed that phage therapy was more of a, um, of a uh, cult than it was really science. So maybe just briefly take us through that case that you of your colleague and uh, just the logistics of what you went through. But forget the informed consent and all that, but just the uh, science side of it and how you administered it and how he responded. Well, the patient was a a man in his late 60s who had gone to um, Egypt uh, on a a vacation uh, around Thanksgiving time uh, in 2016. And he and his wife were floating on a barge up um, the uh, Nile on the way uh, to uh, Luxor uh, when he got acute abdominal pain. Uh, And um, his wife... uh, is a friend of mine as well and got in touch with me and said she thought her husband had um, food poisoning. And as I talked to her more, uh, said it really sounds more to me like pancreatitis. Uh, he's um, uh, had some gallstones in the past um, and um, he's not got diarrhea and he's not vomiting. And um, uh, um, he's, she said, well, he's drinking a lot, so he must be okay. And I said, no, he's got diabetes. He's probably in DKA. You need to get him to a hospital. So they got him to a hospital in Luxor where, um, indeed, he had pancreatitis and a big pancreatic pseudocyst. Um, they gave him some antibiotics, um, and then we were able to get him aerovacked to, uh, to Frankfurt, um, where Stefan Joysom's group took care of him. And they isolated from his pancreatic pseudocyst through a um, uh, percutan- uh, transgastric uh, aspiration a multidrug-resistant acinetobacter. Acinetobacter um, is an organism that uh, has been a real uh, problem in ICUs in the U.S. and around the world. It's colloquially called Arachibacter because it caused a lot of the wounds that um, our troops uh, sustained um, in Desert Storm and other Middle East Middle Eastern um, activities. Um, in those situations, it thrived because a lot of the wounds were uh, wounds from blunt trauma, and the organism, while not normally that invasive, uh, was able to live in poorly vitalized tissues. And antibiotics would diffuse into these tissues variably, and that's a perfect way to select for multidrug-resistant bacteria. And this organism is very good at trading uh, antibiotic resistance genes with its friends. And so there are strains of uh, multidrug-resistant acinetobacter all around the world. Uh, his uh, acinetobacter was uh, sensitive really only to colistin and variably sensitive to minocycline. Um, to make a long story short, um, after about a week uh, in Frankfurt, he was transferred back to UC San Diego. 
Uh, and as we began to take care of him, he got into one of these roller coasters. We wanted the surgeons to drain uh, what turned out to be multiple intra-abdominal abscesses. Uh, they would say, well, he's too sick to operate on. We would um, work with the um, uh, uh, with the um, uh, invasive radiologist and percutaneously drain him as best we could and try to buff him up. And then he'd be getting better. And we'd say, well, he's well enough to operate now. And they said, well, he's getting better. We don't want to mess that up. <laughs> so this went on for about four months, uh, and he continued to deteriorate. He'd have periods of, uh, of uh, septic shock, and we'd uh, buff him, and then he gradually uh, began to see uh, his organs fail. He uh, had to be intubated. Uh, his kidneys uh, were failing. His liver LFTs were rising. He became obtunded. Uh, he ended up uh, by March, this uh, is a member, I said started in Thanksgiving by March, he was on three pressers and um, the uh, ICU team was talking to his wife about comfort measures. Uh, his wife, Stephanie Strathdee, is a, another, as I said, a friend of mine, and she um, is a PhD epidemiologist, but her undergraduate degree was in microbiology. And she uh, had been uh, following Medline and this paper showed up in Medline about bacteriophages um, that uh, were able to, in the laboratory, kill Acinetobacter. And she got in touch with me. I'd been involved in this care and said, could we use these? And um, um, at the time, it was really a kind of a Hail Mary shot. I really didn't know that we'd be able to get them uh, organized uh, and to figure out how to get them in a state that we could deliver them to his infections. But I told her, you know, we've been fooling around with other things for four months, including some fairly high-tech antibiotic combinations and synergy studies and so forth, and we're not making much progress. I don't have any, I can't promise that this will work, but we don't have anything to lose uh, by trying it. And uh, so that's how this all kind of got started. Um, the way we proceeded was that she um, uh, found some... Um, she got in touch with the uh, uh, woman who had published this paper about acinetobacter phages in uh, Georgia, not your Georgia, but their Georgia, uh, near the Soviet Union, by Amir Bishvili, uh, and asked if the phages could be sent to take care of her husband. She said, I'd be glad to send them, but I've already sent them to, um, to Jean-Paul Pernay, who is working on phages for burns, topically in Belgium. He has these phages. Why don't you call him? Uh, she called him and he said, well, I'd be happy to send them to you over in a diplomatic pouch. I'm a military doctor, but they're already at Texas A&M because I've been collaborating with Rye Young at Texas A&M. And so Stephanie then got in touch with Rye, who is quite Rye. Uh, he's a, a, a basic phage researcher and been using these phages to do what you talked about earlier uh, as a gene jockey and to try to understand their biology. And Stephanie said, my husband's dying. I want to treat him. And Rye said, oh, no, -uh, no, -uh, you could kill him with those things. And um, Stephanie said, well, you know, he's dying otherwise. And she kept him on the phone for about two and a half hours. This was a Friday afternoon. And Brad finally said, oh, hell, you, I, I got some postdocs aren't busy this weekend. Just send me the phages. So or send me the bacteria. So uh, we sent the bacteria down to Texas A&M. And within a, about four or five days, he found some phages in his collection. They didn't have to be the ones from Georgia that were active against the acinetobacter. In the meantime, I'd gotten in touch with the FDA, and they turned me on to a group at um, the um, Biodefense uh, Research Center that the Navy runs in Bethesda, who are also working on acinetobacter phages for these troop infections. And they also uh, were willing to test the phages and um, found uh, that they had a handful of phages active against Tom's organism. So that's how we kind of got it started. Uh, we then had to go through the process of figuring out how to scrub them uh, to make them clean enough to um, deliver them safely perennially and um, uh, without going into the details, the two labs had different approaches. Each one thought the other approach would kill the patient, but uh, we trusted that they knew their own. And they delivered uh, within about uh, two and a half weeks, three weeks, uh, uh, each uh, delivered four phages that were active against Tom's um, uh, organism in a um, um, uh, state that was close to GMP. Uh, we could give them perennially. And uh, we um, started uh, uh, with these phages very much like we would antibiotics. We initially 
uh, gave the Texas A&M phages into his abscess cavities by gavage uh, just to look at tolerability. And then a couple of days later, the Navy phages came and we switched to a, an intravenous route. And within about 48 hours, his pressors were coming off and he woke up. And um, after the usual um, series of various disasters in the ICU over the next couple of months for an older guy who'd been there a long time, he got out of the hospital and um, went back to the faculty. I was at a party with him last night. So it was really a, a, a great experience from that perspective. So there's a lot of lessons from this. One is just perseverance and, and creatively thinking about how to uh, treat people who are otherwise in, in dire straits. But I think let's dissect out quickly what you have to do. You have to have an organism uh, and for use of this, you want to have a pan-resistant organism. And then you've got to have a bank of phages that you can try because it has to be matched up uh, really individually, doesn't it? Uh, it's got to be a, a, a unique phage for each individual infection. Is that accurate? That's accurate. Um, it's uh, depending on the bac specific bacterium we're talking about, um, that can be easy or hard. Um, the biology of these phages is that for some bacteria like staph, there are phages that are pretty active against a wide swath of uh, staph we might see clinically. And if you pick up four or five phages, the right phages, uh, you can come up with a cocktail that will knock off 85 or 90 percent of the staph we'd see clinically, which is kind of where we are with antibiotics. And so in that situation, you could envision starting phages empirically and then doing susceptibility testing and adjusting your phages if they aren't active, just like we do with antibiotic selections. Other organisms like Acinetobacter, if you were going to um, uh, try to come up with a phage collection that covered uh, 85 or 90 percent of the um, uh, biology out there, you'd have to have a collection of two or three hundred phages. And so we can't make a cocktail of two or three hundred phages, either practically or because some phages inactivate each other when you put them in the same, uh, same flask. So in that situation, you really have to do personalized medicine, have the patient's organism in your hand um, and match them uh, to select them. Now that's getting easier because you can do it um, with robotics uh, and people have large phage collections that are already ready to roll that you can test. And uh, most of the time these days, we can find phages that are active um, in a relatively short period of time. Um, uh, if, they're, if they happen to be in somebody's library and we get a uh, bacterium today, we could have an answer uh, uh, within about a morrow, very much like susceptibility testing for antibiotics. Uh, sometimes uh, with more unusual organisms, we don't have phages in a, phage, in a library that are uh, active against that organism. We have to go out to the environment and screen for them, and that can take a long time. Yeah. Uh, that involves kind of going to where that bacterium lives uh, and looking for phages that live on it in nature. So you're looking for E. coli phages, you go to um, the water works up there on 280 in Birmingham, the sewage treatment plant. Oh, that's actually, that's the water treatment plant. Um, <laughs> you don't have a sewage treatment plant in Alabama, I understand. Or I guess you do in Birmingham now. No, it's, it's, all all fixed. Yeah. it's all fixed. But um, I'm saying this is a former Alabamian, so don't, don't be too angry with me. So anyway, um, from the standpoint of... Um, of looking for phages, uh, you go to where they live. Uh, if it, you're looking for staph phage, you might want to get a bunch of um, of, of uh, dirty bandages from people with staph infections. Uh, if you're looking for uh, phages for um, a um, Acinetobacter, uh, environmental sources, soil might be a place you'd go. So it really depends on where they live because uh, their phages are going to be chasing them wherever they are. So when you infuse this, uh, let's say, perennially, it goes and distributes, goes to the site of infection, and uh, it infects the Acinetobacter in this case. And then I imagine it, it proliferates uh, within that abscess or that cavity where it actually makes more of itself, I would guess, and that that helps the antimicrobial activity. Is that what happens? And what's the ultimate, uh, what's the ultimate outcome for the phage that was infused? It just burns out and, and is cleared or dies or uh, what happens in that setting? Well, we're learning a lot about that formally now as phages move into a more traditional antibiotic or antimicrobial development uh, pathway. Um, one of the things that I firmly believe is that phages need to be um, uh, developed, studied clinically very much like we would an antibiotic. The only difference is these are living antibiotics. Um, 
just like antibiotics, which were developed by microbes to kill other microbes nearby, uh, phages have been coming out of bacteria, killing other bacteria nearby. So these do the same thing in nature, and we use them the same way in people. We have to understand uh, what the differences are, though, um, and you've alluded to them, some of them already, uh, in terms of how we might try to harness them therapeutically. Uh, when we give them intravenously, um, they are cleared out by the RE system pretty quickly. Uh, you can see uh, a couple of log drop uh, in phage um, uh, counts in the plasma within an hour or so uh, when you give them intravenously. Uh, they're picked up by the uh, RE system, the liver and spleen. Uh, they tend to be destroyed in the liver. They sometimes persist for a while in the spleen. Uh, but if you happen to have an infection with an organism uh, that they are able to um, predate or uh, invade, during that period of circulation, uh, our um, hope is that they will find that organism and once there at that site, replicating the organisms and self-amplify and, and continue to take care of the infection. Um, studies now are being done to try to uh, understand in a more quantitative way using the same kinds of approaches we did uh, back with, when it, with any retroviral therapy, when you and others were looking at, uh, at uh, viral kinetics and uh, what the implications there were there for therapeutics, um, using the same, the same set of modelers uh, that worked on that, like Alan Pearlson, have emerged from uh, the uh, woodwork to work on phages. And um, they're going to be very uh, insightful in terms of how often we have to give them to keep an infection site seeded, uh, whether or not different types of infections need to be treated differently. We would expect they would. We have to treat different uh, infections differently with antibiotics. Uh, but uh, over time, I think these principles will, uh, will play out. Uh, when the bacteria that they eat are gone, the phages fall apart. So they don't hang around and, um, and cause problems. Uh, they aren't excreted by the liver or by the kidneys, so you don't have to run around with the bag full of a pocket full of algorithms calculating doses and you don't have the pharmacist harassing you about being um, two micrograms above the target level uh, so they're in some ways easier to give as long as you understand how much endotoxin is in them uh, we're doing a dose ranging study uh, with the support of the nih uh, the uh, uh, division of microbiology and infectious diseases antibiotic resistance leadership group the chip chambers and um, Vance Fowler lead um, is doing a study uh, that uh, Pranita Tama and I are running, trying to understand optimal dosing when administered by uh, an intravenous route to people with cystic fibrosis who are shedding uh, pseudomonas. Um, we're comparing three doses, and we'll try to understand from that uh, two things, or many things, but uh, prime things are one uh, of the doses we're choosing, and we're choosing 10 to the 7th, 10 to the 8th, and 10 to the 9th plaque forming units, which is a way to measure the number of infectious particles, um, which dose uh, maxes out in terms of anti-pseudomonas uh, activity in the sputum. And we want to look to see how long the phages persist in the sputum after uh, a dose. And that'll help us understand uh, how frequently to dose them, what dose to give. Uh, as we move forward, we'll have to think about other types of infections. You can imagine a lung full of pseudomonas the seeding idea is great. The other type of, um, of indication that, in terms of case reports at least, is uh, more frequently um, uh, being um, uh, published these days are to treat uh, implanted devices. And by that I mean hips, knees, um, topics that are close to both of us, um, and uh, pacemakers. And the reason they um, are being uh, used there is that one of the reasons we have trouble sterilizing these um, implanted devices uh, when they become infected with antibiotics is there are biofilms that make it difficult for the antibiotics to get to full sterility. They just break up biofilms. Uh, and so that um, we've uh, seen an a increasing number of people who failed antibiotic therapy who, when phages are given concomitantly, then clear the infection and don't need to have the device removed uh, and replaced, which is a big plus. That's a game changer. Uh, so uh, there are a lot of niches, but in that niche, if you think about it, rather than having a whole uh, lawn of bacteria, you might have a few bacteria on the end of your uh, femoral implant and a few more up in that tabulum. And so uh, repeated dosing uh, where you keep hoping to drive the uh, phage 
to the site uh, might be a better approach than trying to seed them once and watch it go. Again, it's going to take clinical trials to sort that out. All right. So we're unfortunately about out of time, but just to summarize, the use of natural occurring bacteriophages that have been around for eons, uh, we're starting to now harness, as you said, laser bombs, if you will, that go in, identify the targeted bacteria, uh, and then even once it's in that site, can use that targeted bacterium almost as a factory in the local area to kind of blow it up even more and really eliminate the infection, eradicate it completely. And the beauty also is uh, its potential use for other difficult to treat infections, not just because of resistance, but because of biofilms and other things. It's clearly a really exciting frontier that I'm sure we're going to see evolve over the next uh, five to 10 years. Where do you think we'll be? Uh, 10 years from now, will you think this will become of age and we'll be using it routinely for certain indications with dosing, as you suggested, by uh, uh, PFUs and that type of thing? I think we will. I think we really, A, um, have a real ally in phages in terms of their uh, antimicrobial activity uh, and their, uh, I think we didn't talk about toxicity because there's nothing to say. Uh, we haven't seen any toxicity yet. Uh, in pure phage preparations. Um, and with where we are with, with antibiotic development, it's getting increasingly um, uh, uh, slowed down. Uh, it takes a long time to develop antibiotics, hundreds of millions of dollars. Phages, you can uh, go out and uh, grow from your backyard. Uh, the uh, drug industry is backing off on investments in new blockbuster antibiotics. They haven't had any blockbusters lately. So going to need to come up with something different. I think phages may be one of those different things. I hope there are other things as well. Um, the other thing that, uh, and, and to get to where you're talking about 10 years from now, it's going to take clinical trials where we work out the principles of phage therapy. Uh, we uh, had AZT come along in 1986, but the principles of therapy with all the quantitative relationships that you and others worked out uh, took about another 10 years to develop. It was the mid nineties before we got to Vancouver and people said, I'm giving all these two or three drugs together and uh, get the population down and deal with these mutations and so forth and so on. We've got a, a, got a winner here. And that's kind of where we are with phages. We need to do that kind of research with an iterative process of clinical trials with good translational backup uh, to understand what we're doing under the hood when we do these trials and iterate to, to have things uh, improve. In parallel with that, Genetic engineering is improving the phages, and we're already giving genetically engineered phages that can change the lifestyle from a temperate phage to a lytic phage. Um, you can uh, engineer into phages Cas CRISPR, so they attack the bacteria with their own weapons. Uh, you can increase the potency of lysins. You can increase the potency of the biofilm uh, busting capabilities of a phage. And these uh, genetically engineered phages are going to be worked on the same way. So I think there's a lot to do here. And I think we um, are fortunate to have uh, these tools at our disposal at a time when we really need them. Yeah. Well, fascinating discussion in a really exciting area that clearly is at the frontier of not antiviral, but using viruses as antibacterial therapies. It's really exciting. Chip, thank you for being with us. And, uh, and I know this uh, podcast will generate a lot of interest, and I look forward to seeing how this all evolves in the future. Thanks. Thanks, Mike. Have a good day. Bye-bye. Thank you for listening to this episode of Going Antiviral. Catch up on earlier episodes wherever you listen to podcasts and check out the video versions of this episode and others on the IASUSA YouTube channel. You can find these links in the show notes or simply go to YouTube and search for IES USA, and there they are. Be sure to subscribe, rate, and review Going Antiviral on Apple Podcast. This podcast is for informational and educational purposes only and is not intended to serve as medical advice. Opinions expressed in this podcast do not necessarily reflect the opinions of the IES USA or its affiliates. If you have a question you'd like answered on the show, you can send it to podcast at iasusa.org to be answered in a future episode.